أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم We are uh, honored at Dar al-Qasim College to host for our evening uh, lecture, adult lecture series Dr. Samir Mahmoud who will be discussing uh, Ibn Arabi's aesthetics today A little bit about Dr. Samir Dr. Samir Afwan Mahmoud He's currently the academic director at the Usul Academy and is also the program manager of the Diploma in Islamic Psychology at the Muslim Cambridge Muslim College. He holds uh, numerous degrees. The first is BA in Anthropology and Politics with his fo focus on multicultural theory and comparative religion, fo followed by an MA in Architectural History, Theory and Urban Design, from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. In addition, he holds uh, another master's in philosophy and theology and Islamic studies with a focus on comparative philosophy and a PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Dr. Tim Winter. Dr. Mahmoud is also was a former uh, Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Arts and Humanities Initiative at the University of Beirut, American University of Beirut, and a postdoc research associate at the University of Oxford. He was also a visiting postdoc fellow at MIT. Some of his recent uh, articles discuss intellectual, spiritual, and moral foundations uh, regarding Tazkiyat nafs the purification of the self, as well as the inner dimension of prayer. Um, uh, many of these themes uh, will likely uh, be reflected in his discussion today on Ibn Arabi's aesthetics, a few introductory reflections. Tafadlasin, we're honored to have you. Thank you very much for a wonderful and very generous introduction. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa salatu wa salatu wa taslim. Assalamu alaykum everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Dalal Qasim and um, Sheikh uh, Amin Khulwadiya and all those who uh, invited me, alhamdulillah, to this wonderful institution. Uh, when we talk about aesthetics or even Arabic aesthetics or aesthetics in general, I think uh, we need to interrogate the very term itself. So in the first 15 minutes, inshallah, before I get into Ibn Arabi, I want to um, explore the, the very notion of aesthetics itself uh, before we get into if there is such a thing as uh, Ibn Arabi uh, aesthetics. So what are the theoretical challenges to understanding uh, Islamic aesthetics? Um, one of the important things to bear in mind when we talk about aesthetics, it is, it is a term that is derived from the European philosophical tradition, and uh, it has no uh, direct equivalent in the Islamic tradition. In fact, it has no direct equivalent in medieval European tradition, for that matter, or any other tradition. So it's, a, it's a, quite a novelty as a, as a field of investigation. Um, we often associate aesthetics with questions of beauty and art, and um, I'll get to that uh, in a minute. But uh, with the Islamic tradition, of course, if one were to uh, begin such an exploration, one would start with the Quranic references to al hasan wal Jamal, uh, Arabic terms like al Maliyah, al Wasim, um, and other terms like Jamal, for example, in this very famous hadith, in Allah Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Um, and then one would begin to perhaps explore what this question of beauty actually means in the Islamic tradition. And the Islamic intellectual tradition, of course, was influenced by uh, Greek thought to a large extent. And uh, the term and the notion of beauty figures quite prominently in philosophical discussions in the Greek tradition. Um, and as you can see here, in Plato's Symposium and his other writings. Uh, as I said earlier, the very term aesthetics itself has a very specific history related to the uh, 17th, 18th century uh, European philosophical tradition, especially the works of Immanuel Kant and um, Baumgarten, who initiated the field of aesthetics itself. The term actually is derived from Greek, and it means things perceivable by the senses. It's associated with that which is perceived by the senses. And uh, in the European philosophical tradition, they developed a branch of philosophical inquiry uh, that specialized in understanding uh, how we perceive the sensible world 
and from that it evolved into uh, uh, things of beauty, the study of, of that, uh, those objects uh, perceived by the senses that are considered beautiful, harmonious and ordered. Um, but it's a long and treacherous history of how it actually uh, came about. By the 19th century, under the influence of the development of the new field of aesthetics in, in European philosophy, uh, many of the so-called Nahda period and the late uh, Fonzimat period in the Ottoman period, um, so in the Ottoman uh, world and in Egypt, many of the emerging Nahda scholars uh, uh, during that period attempted to translate a lot of the philosophical works uh, of the European thinkers and um, and equivalent find equivalent terms in Arabic for uh, the uh, the terms used in European philosophy. And one of those terms, aesthetics, um, was uh, explored, and it was suggested that the term Ilm al Jaman, uh, which is a, a term that was coined by these um, Arabic figures, uh, to be the equivalent of um, aesthetics. Now, aesthetics, initially, as I said earlier, uh, was a term that referred some, to something broader than the field of uh, beauty. It referred to a, ph a philosophical investigation of those things perceived by the senses. But in, even in European thought, it gradually became restricted to an investigation of uh, beauty in the world and uh, all the other uh, terms associated with beauty. Um, and that became adopted in an Arabic language um, and integrated into 19th century um, Arab Islamic thought, especially in the Ottoman. Uh, period, uh, the Ottoman uh, sphere, and in Egypt and the Levant, um, and so Ilm al-Jamal becomes uh, this uh, term used to uh, explore questions of aesthetic emotion and formal expression. So things that associated with the perception of beauty, but also how we feel in response in the presence of beauty. Now, one might argue that given that this is a term that refers to a unique cultural development uh, that is distinctly part of the European tradition. One wonders and one is justified in asking whether uh, an Islamic aesthetics is justified, particularly given that the underlying philosophical assumptions for the development of aesthetics as a separate branch of philosophy might not be entirely justified from the traditional Islamic perspective. However, another argument uh, is that given that we are overwhelmed and uh, literally um, uh, formed by uh, this European, let's say, um, discourse and worldview, that perhaps uh, a critical engagement with the term might be uh, beneficial. I've in, I've chosen to engage with the term in my own work, um, but uh, to engage with it from an Islamic perspective by gradually expanding the scope of aesthetics to include a wide range of things that are more consistent with the way in which the medieval Islamic tradition may have explored uh, these questions. We don't have time to get into that particular issue here in this presentation, because uh, I want to focus on Ibn Arabi a little bit later. But I, I, do, I did want to um, start with this preliminary theoretical considerations, because it is important to always think about and keep in the back of our mind. Now, given that Islamic, the term aesthetic itself does not have a direct equivalent in the Islamic tradition, nonetheless, one can proceed forward with the term aesthetics um, very cautiously because the correlata, the terms we often associate with aesthetics, like pleasure, form, perception, creativity, art, color, harmony, proportion, imagination, uh, beauty, etc., all these terms that we often think about and uh, we often associate with the term aesthetics. Um, were discussed separately in the Islamic tradition. So there are extensive discussions on, on pleasure, form, perception, creativity, proportion, etc. So um, while the term aesthetics does not exist in the Islamic tradition um, or outside the European, uh, late European philosophical tradition, uh, nonetheless, the, 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 the terms and ideas associated with it were discussed at, at length. And so one can make the argument for a kind of a a positive, constructive, yet critical engagement with this term itself. And therefore, um, an Islamic aesthetics would be um, uh, an, the development of a field that looks at the way in which the uh, classical Islamic tradition 
perceived and understood and discussed these various terms or notions we often associate with contemporary aesthetics. Now, I said with caution because what we eventually find is uh, when we explore questions of pleasure, for example, or questions of, uh, of proportion or harmony in the Islamic tradition, we often find that these so-called aesthetic correlata often uh, um, uh, overlap with discussions in ethics, discussions in fiqh, in discussions in philosophy, discussions in tazkiyat and nafs, etc. So we'll find that even if we try to restrict the term uh, and explore them uh, as notions uh, separate from other discussions, um, we will find that the discussions always lead back into uh, um, uh, areas of investigation that are often uh, excluded in contemporary discussions of aesthetics. And it's important to bear in mind because we have to follow discussions where they lead us. In this sense, then, any investigation into an aesthetics in the medieval Islamic tradition must be one in which, and I quote here uh, uh, a wonderful quote by Umberto Eco, which kind of reflects this point, we must look for the ways in which a given epoch, in this instance, uh, the classical Islamic tradition, solved for itself aesthetic problems as they presented themselves at the time to the sensibilities and the culture of its people. In this instance, then, our historical inquiries will be a contribution not to whatever we perceive aesthetics to be, but rather to the history of a specific civilization from the standpoint of its own sensibility and its own aesthetic consciousness. This is a very important point that while any investigation into the question of aesthetics or art or beauty has to see how these things were understood from the perspective of the classical Islamic tradition itself and um, investigate uh, the topic uh, in dialogue with all the other terms that it is associated with. Uh, in the medieval Islamic tradition, art and beauty uh, um, are linked to ethics and spirituality. And you find this in the very etymology of terms like al-hasan wal husn. Um, so the good and uh, the beautiful. These are terms that derive from the same etymological word, uh, uh, may explore different aspects of beauty, one that is formal and one that is, sorry, one that is moral and one that is formal, but nonetheless, they are intimately connected and undergirded by a common um, outlook on reality. Um, these uh, terms, beauty, formal beauty and moral beauty have been separated and severed quite violently in uh, European thought. And it's not something that we need to necessarily accept. And so any investigation into Islamic aesthetics has to um, expand the purview of aesthetics so that it is it does justice to the manner in which it was understood in the medieval uh, or classical Islamic tradition. Now, the difficulties facing the, the, the subject exploring this topic uh, are, are numerous because um, you rarely find um, uh, a book or a treatise dedicated exclusively to this topic. And if you look at the classical tabtib al-ulum and the classification of the sciences in Islam, you rarely find um, a separate section that discusses uh, what we would today call aesthetics. For example, Al-Kindi placed architecture and music in the chapter on mathematics. And you'll find similar discussions of poetry and music and architecture in the writings of Al-Farabi, Ikhwan al-Safad, and Sina al-Ghazali. So you rarely find a separate, uh, let's say, single subject dedicated to this topic. In fact, what you have to do is really piece together from, from a variety of different disciplines. Uh, a would-be scholar might want to start with the fountain of all knowledge, and that is start look, looking at the way in which the Qur'an explores the idea of a moral uh, and formal beauty, let's say, for example. Uh, but if one were to look at the Islamic intellectual tradition, uh, one can discern three possible approaches to exploring the question of aesthetics. The first is one might want to explore a, a specific school of thought and, and look at how they saw uh, questions of beauty or proportion or harmony or aesthetics. Another approach might be uh, one might look at um, key figures. And um, a third approach might be to look at a particular theme. I'll explain all, every single one of these in a, in a minute. So what does it mean to explore beauty or aesthetics from the perspective of a single school of thought? One can make the case that there is a distinct uh, school of thought called philosophy, a falsafa in Islam, 
uh, I wouldn't say school of thought, but a, a movement of thinkers who belong broadly to the philosophical tradition, in which case one can make the argument that there is an Islamic philosophical aesthetics that is rooted in some kind of Neoplatonic distinction between intelligible and sensible beauty. And the typical to com com topics you find is explored in this field would be uh, on the nature of love, intelligible and sensible beauty, poetic beauty, diction and inspiration. One could also make the argument for a different school of thought. For example, one could uh, explore how Mutakallimun explored uh, or understood notions we often associate with aesthetics. What would Mutakallim uh, discuss? Uh, how would the Mutakallim discuss the question of Jamal or sensible perception, etc.? Um, or uh, and one could find theological discussions on the signs of God in nature, a discussion about the attributes, uh, the immutability of the Quran the dangers of sensual pleasure, among other topics that uh, uh, lend themselves to aesthetic investigations, at least among the Mutakallimu. Another, uh, perhaps, school of thought or, uh, uh, let's say, uh, intellectual, spiritual uh, tendency in Islam would be associated with Tasawwuf in general. Um, one could make the argument that there is, a let's just say, a Sufi aesthetics in, in some sense. And one would look at writings on the nature of beauty, love, perception, the image and imagination, the human form, the inner versus the outer, and the psychology of beauty, especially in the writings of Muhammad al-Ghazali, uh, Ruzbihan Barkli, Suhra Wardi ibn Arabi, etc. So uh, this is this is insofar as we are talking about various um, distinct uh, intellectual um, uh, currents uh, within the Islamic tradition. Of course, one could also make the case that uh, there is a distinct uh, literary aesthetics um, that where discussions on the nature of imagery and poetry, especially in the writings of Al-Zahid, Al-Qatajani, Al-Jurjani, uh, which may reveal an indigenous Arab Islamic poetics independent of Aristotle's poetics, for example. One could also investigate uh, other uh, fields of knowledge like alchemy, alchemical discussions, uh, writings on dreams and imagination. There are even um, uh, fiqh lend itself to a unique perspective on the nature of some aesthetic issues. And recently, a friend of mine, a Lebanese scholar, uh, published a book on on uh, on Maliki fiqh uh, or fiqh discussions of art that are found in the fiqh manuals in in the Maghrib and Spain. Also, if one were to investigate the various dictionaries uh, compiled in the Arabic tradition. Uh, or uh, lexicographic works, for example, Taj uh, al-Harus, Risan al-Arab, etc., one would find uh, very interesting discussions on the meaning of beauty, the meaning of, uh, of uh, moral goodness, the meaning of proportion and harmony, etc. Again, uh, in the field of some scientific investigations, uh, one could find very detailed discussions of issues related to vision and perception, of harmony and proportion, and the way in which the eye perceives the world in the writings of optics, for example, the writings of Ibn al-Haytham and Kamal al-Din al-Farisi. So this is this is this what this suggests is that if one were to really ask the question, what is Islamic aesthetics? One really has to pluralize the term aesthetics because there are various uh, aesthetic tendencies within Islam or various aesthetic sensibilities, um, and one would have to really search through a variety of different fields of knowledge to piece together some picture as to how uh, classical Muslims understood, discussed, or perceived the terms and notions we often associate with aesthetics, like proportion, beauty, harmony, perception, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an it's a, it's a emerging field um, that requires a lot of scholarship, a lot of patience. Um, I mentioned that there are three possible approaches to the sources. One could look at a school of thought, an intellectual current like a falsafa or kalam or tasawwuf and look at that one could actually adopt a different approach and say what does a particular figure have to say about beauty so one could go through the works of ghazali and um, demonstrate that ghazali has this to say about beauty or this to say about color or whatever it is um, so one could look at uh, figures like um, al jahiz al-farabi ibn sina a wide variety of different figures and ask the question how do these particular individuals or figures look at the question of um, uh, we often associate with aesthetics? Uh, in this particular in instance, I will be looking at Ibn Harabi, some of his ideas uh, in this presentation, which we'll, I'll start with now, inshallah. 
So what, what is Ibn Arabi's unique contribution to this uh, nebulous field called aesthetics or the investigation of beauty? There are so many ideas, and I'm, I'm going to go over some ideas here in this presentation by manner of an introduction. Um, each one of these could be uh, an hour to hour presentation on its own. Um, but just to give you an idea, some of the ideas I'll be looking at, for example, um, the Arabi discusses this, uh, the, uh, what he called Nafas al-Rahman, the breath of compassion. Um, for those of you who have studied geometry, uh, this image on the right is called uh, the Nafas al-Rahman, or the breath of the compassionate one. Um, you find it in some uh, geometry manuals and teachings. Um, and this kind of uh, star or petals of a flower unfolding from a center uh, is uh, visually suggestive of the unfolding breath of the divine that brings forth creation into being. So this very image of, um, of an unfolding compassionate breath in which all things contained within, within this breath, all things exist in latent, in latency, as it were, is a very powerful image and it's very powerful, let's say one might call very powerful aesthetic image about the nature of creation, um, whereby uh, reality is underpinned by the, the, the quality of Rahmah. And this is very important, at least from the Ibn Arabi's perspective. And I'll have a little bit more to say about this as we move along. One could also explore other ideas like uh, the, the created world and the word, divine majesty and beauty, love and beauty, creativity of the artist, the beauty of the human form, and imagination and the image. So I'll, I'll go through each one of these uh, quite briefly. But like I said, uh, this image uh, symbolizes, as it were, or is a beautiful visualization of this idea of the breath of the compassionate one. But that, and that the understanding of creation, uh, creation unfolds as a result of um, this divine breathing outward of creation. Of course, this is an image. It's not a, a literal thing to, underst to understood quite literally. It's a very powerful image that captures, at least in the realm of our material understanding of things, the breathing in and out is a projection, a heavenly projection of a primordial breathing in and out that brought forth creation into existence. So this image of creation saturated with uh, Rahmah. Now, within the breath of the divine compassion, of course, um, uh, there is a, a very important uh, point that Ibn Arabi often illustrates. We often understand, uh, and Ibn Arabi makes this distinction, uh, like many before him, this distinction between divine majesty and divine beauty, al Jalal and Jamal. Uh, what is quite innovative or new about Ibn Arabi, and he says himself in one of his treatises that no one before him has mentioned this, is that Ibn Arabi insists that divine majesty, um, in its absolute sense, refers to um, uh, the divine essence, and that creation is a result of divine beauty. Now, you might wonder, well, then where does the jalal or majesty in creation come from? And it kind of makes this interesting distinction between majesty of beauty and the beauty of beauty. So in Ibn Arabi's understanding, absolute majesty is something that only the divine knows, and it reflects the divine essence. Um, beauty, which is anchored in divine rahmah, or beauty is the formal aspect of Rahma. Uh, one can understand it that way. Beauty is then manifest in two distinct ways. Uh, there is the majesty of beauty and the beauty of beauty. So in answer to the question, where does all the majesty in the world that we perceive come from? It derives from the majesty of beauty, not the majesty of majesty. Why? Ibn Arabi says, and he insists on this point, Absolute majesty is so overwhelming that if it were to manifest, um, it would overwhelm existence. And so divine majesty has to be mediated through divine jaman, beauty. And in that sense, then, all the majesty that we perceive in the world is actually the majesty of divine beauty, uh, not majesty of majesty itself directly. 
Um, so in the realm of manifestation, then, all of creation is a direct result of the unfolding of formal beauty from divine Rahman, the divine breath. And so the beauty we perceive in the world, um, sorry, I've, uh, the beauty is written incorrectly here. Yeah, I'll, I'll correct that a little bit later. Um, but the, um, the type of um, uh, beauty that we perceive in the world is actually an instance of uh, beauty of divine beauty. So in, in that way, and as we'll see a little bit later, every single beautiful thing in the world, Ibn Arabi says, is, uh, well, actually, let me put it this way. Everything in existence is intrinsically beautiful. We may not perceive its intrinsic beauty, but the things that we do see are beautiful, like a beautiful tree or uh, a beautiful work of art, is actually a beauty upon beauty. Uh, and um, actually underlying everything is this quality of beauty. And so the, the qualified beauty that we perceive in the world that we designate as beautiful, we call, uh, he calls Jamal Muqayyad, or relative beauty. But every single thing, even if we don't perceive it as beautiful, is actually intrinsically beautiful. And, that, and this is its uh, absolute nature. It's, it's uh, Jamal uh, Mutlaq. Because um, we may need to uh, develop a certain perceptual capacity to perceive the intrinsic beauty of all things. So the things that we call beautiful in this world, a beautiful face or a, a beautiful tree or a beautiful uh, geometric pattern, is actually a beauty overlaying a more intrinsic beauty. Um, and the Arif or the Gnostic is the one who is able to see the intrinsic beauty of all things. Uh, al Jamal al Mutlaq, all things. Um, there's a lot to be said about this. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now, but of course, Ibn Arabi then gets into a very detailed discussion about what are the qualities that we perceive? What, what's the, what are the internal uh, uh, inner qualities that we feel and experience in the presence of beauty or majesty? And here he gets into a very detailed, very interesting psychological and spiritual discussion of the nature of uns, intimacy, and haiba, or um, in the presence of uh, beauty and majesty. Um, and so, to summarize then, uh, uh, majesty is related to, uh, majesty in its absolute sense is related to the divine essence, but beauty um, is that which qualifies the world. And all the majesty we perceive in the world is actually a majesty of divine beauty. So it's a manifestation of majesty of the divine beauty itself, not a, ma the, a direct manifestation of absolute majesty itself. Okay. In that sense, we spoke about um, the, the world unfolding as uh, 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 a breath. Um, within, within breath, there are contained the amorphous sounds of words that, when once congealed, turn into words. Um, letters turn into words, and they form the reality of things. And so in Arabi's understanding, the cosmos consists of words. This is the Quranic verse. So all of existence um, is nothing but uh, uh, words. Um, and uh, underpinning words, of course, are letters. So all things are combinations of a variety of different letters, which when uh, put together, constitute the things of the world. Another way of saying this is that the divine word acts as the algorithmic code that gives the world order and pattern. The divine word is the algorithmic code that gives the world order and pattern. So each thing then is a manifestation of the forms of this pattern within the world of matter. At the center, is it, as it were, is Allah, and unfolding from that center, center is divine speech, kun fayakun, and that speech congeals and coagulates into the various forms of things that we see in the world. Another way of putting it is to say the underlying the matrix of existence are uh, things that are words and underlying and underpinning them are the divine names of course so uh, Ibn Arabi dedicates an entire chapter in the foot of heart to the discussion of the Arabic alphabet which I won't get into here um, in, in any detail but um, the Arabic alphabet consists of the 28 letters or what he called 28 primordial divine letters um, and in order to create the cosmos with all its invisible and visible levels, God composes words and sentences and books employing those 28 
letters. Again, it repeats, repeating what I said uh, a little bit earlier. This is a wonderful translation by William Chittick in his book um, on the chapter of um, 198 of the Futahat al makiya this, this is a very beautiful work of calligraphy in the Sino-Arabic or Chinese-Arabic tradition uh, composed by a wonderful Muslim calligrapher. And uh, the calligraphy, there's no, it's no wonder that calligraphy uh, has such a prominent place in Islamic tradition because calligraphy is the quintessential Islamic art it being uh, the uh, the manifestation of uh, this precise uh, process of creating the world with words. There are many uh, other topics in Ibn Arabi that we can discuss in regards to um, uh, aesthetics, uh, like beauty and love. Ibn Arabi makes a very clear distinction in his Futuhat between three different levels of beauty and three different levels of love. And for those of you um, uh, not familiar with this idea, for Ibn Arabi, as it was for as it, as it is for many of the great um, Arafa, or Ahl al-Arfan, Ahl al-Anam, Ahl al-Marifa, uh, their uh, love is a relationship born of beauty. So where there is beauty, there is love. Where there is love, there is beauty. Love is the glue, the relationship that draws one thing to another. Beauty is the attribute in the things that are causing the love. So beauty is the cause of love. Now, uh, of course, there are three di different levels. So there's divine beauty that corresponds to that divine love. Ilahi, hub, uh, jamal ilahi. That's at the level of the divine reality. But in the realm of the manifest existence, we have al hubb al-Ruhani, or al-Jamal al-Ruhani also corresponding to that, and hubb tabiyyi wa jamal tabiyyi or muqayyad. And why this is important is because Ibn Arabi makes a very clear distinction, uh, whether it's in the relationship between two human beings, the man and the woman, who love one another. Um, he makes a distinction between the different types of beauty and the different types of love. Uh, suffice it to say here, very quickly, to summarize the idea, uh, some of these ideas, Jamal al-Tabi'i, or al muqayyad is the kind of beauty that is um, discernible at the level or level of physical existence. So when we perceive uh, physical beauty and our inner basida does not penetrate beyond the physicality of that beauty, uh, we are in the grip of, we, we are drawn to that physical beauty through a natural love for a natural beauty. But he often defines it as muqayyad, relative, or um, it's bounded love uh, because it's bounded to a particular type of beauty because uh, uh, being drawn to pure physical beauty uh, is not enough um, it, it actually can be a snare because we need to penetrate beyond that physical beauty to that which is manifesting in the physical beauty itself and so a deeper level of perception will lead one to perceiving al-jamal al-ruhani and developing or spiritual beauty and developing its corresponding spiritual love, or humbruhani. Ultimately, the ultimate goal is then to gaze beyond that and to see the jamal al-ilahi, the divine beauty manifesting through all things, thereby developing a hub ilahi. Um, um, now, a lot more can be said about this. As I said earlier, we can do um, a whole presentation on this, because Ibn Arabi gets into a very detailed discussion on the different types of, of, of love also. So I've summarized them here into three different levels, but you can actually subdivide each one into several categories. And in several treatises, um, um, and in some of the Akbarian tradition, like Sheikh Abdul Ghani Nabulsi and others, they have written entire treatises um, distinguishing between different kinds of love and those that are legitimate between human beings and with those which are only legitimate between the, um, the human reality and divine reality. And then, again, Ibn Abi Arabi, we find some wonderful dis uh, discussions on the nature of image and imagination. Uh, again, this could be a whole presentation of it on its own, but for those of you who don't know, Ibn Arabi makes a very important distinction between um, uh, three worlds, uh, the spiritual world, the intermediate world of the soul, and the physical world of the body. Now, within the intermediate world of the soul, there is uh, there are two levels, as it were, 
uh, there is that aspect of the soul that is closer to the spiritual world of the ruh, and there was that aspect of uh, the soul that is closer to our physical, somatic, bodily existence. And so one can make a distinction between uh, these two um, um, uh, quite clearly and easily. Uh, now, corresponding to these three different worlds, there are different types of imagination. So the part of our psych, uh, the part of our ex inner existence that is bound to the body or closer to the body or closer to our own, let's say, psychic constitution, the uh, refers to a type of imagination that is associated with this called khayal muttasib, conjoined imagination. Conjoined imagination means it's conjoined, it's attached or connected to our own individual uh, constitution. And that kind of psychological imagination um, or this kind of conjoined imagination has two further distinctions. Um, at its lowest level, it produces images associated with fantasy and wahm. They're, they're not real. Kind of like daydreaming images or other um, ahlam images. But there are also psychological images uh, produced by the psychological imagination. With these are images that have to do uh, and are related to our own in, inner life of our own biographical existence. But Bradley makes a distinction that there's a higher imagination within us that is called khayal munfasid, this joint imagination. And this higher faculty of imagination is what is responsible for the production of the higher spiritual images that link us to alam, alam al ruh. Uh, in contemporary parlance, many scholars don't make a distinction between these. And unfortunately, in the English, English language, it, we often say something is imaginary, we mean by it something that is not real. Um, and sometimes we use the word imagination to refer to things that are not real. Uh, but in the Akbarian tradition, at least for Ibn Arabi, um, that is correct only insofar as we are referring to the lower type of imagination. But there is a higher type of imagination associated with the heart, um, or Hain al-Basira, or Dhawq and Kashf, that has to do with linking us to the spiritual world. And the, the important thing about the spiritual imagination, as opposed to the psychological imagination, is that the one comes from below, whereas the other comes from above. This leads us to a very important distinction between uh, different types of images. If there are different types of imagination, there are, then there are different types of images. And so corresponding to our physical body, uh, there are the concrete things of the world um, or the formal world. And corresponding to the spiritual world, there are spiritual realities and um, which are formless or imageless. And then corresponding to the level of imagination called fantasy and wham, we have illusory images. Corresponding to the psychological imagination, we have psychological images. And corresponding to the spiritual imagination, we have spiritual images. This is the, this is the domain where we perceive many of our highest forms of ru'ya and many of the highest forms of spiritual perceptions. Because we do have capacity to perceive higher realities in certain kind of spiritual images and forms. Um, um, but these are not produced by the lower imagination, they're actually, in fact, produced by the higher imagination. You can immediately see the relevance of these distinctions for our understanding, for example, of contemporary art and aesthetics, which I'm not going to get into here, but uh, these very uh, brilliant distinctions by Sheikh Al-Akbar help us understand where uh, many of the images are in, of contemporary art are produced, where they're from, uh, and whether they're actually related to spiritual images or not, or whether they're actually illusory images coming from below, almost a, an infernal realm of the lower psyche and its own um, illusory fantasy one. Okay, I want to also move on to a few more ideas uh, Ibn Arabi. Um, he makes a very important distinction in his writings between divine and human creativity. And in, uh, in several sections of the Putahat, Ibn Arabi makes a distinction between three levels or three degrees of creation. There's the Qadir, there's Ijad, and there's Taswir. Measuring out or designing, as it were, to use a contemporary term, Taqdeer is when a certain idea is 
imagined or conceptualized in the mind. And uh, uh, that is not yet brought into existence. Existentiation or ijad is when the thing is brought into existence. And form giving taswir is when this particular thing is given a particular form. Now for Shaykh Al-Akbar, of course, um, human beings participate in, in various ways in these various types of um, uh, creation. Except for Ibn Arabi, existentiation ijad is one thing that human beings are not capable of doing so whereas the divine creates things um, from nothing or the divine creates things from a completely original creation and the divine can uh, bring things forth into creation all human beings can actually do is um, create things from uh, things that already exist so the artist is largely defined by his capacity or her capacity to give forms. Though the artist does participate in all these forms, all these uh, degrees of creation, um, the artist does so in a very different way from the divine, of course. So the divine uh, and does not require uh, designing or conceptualizing things in the... In, uh, um, um, from something. So the divine creates things from a perspective of complete ibda'a, whereas the artist requires a certain degree of relying on precedence, on pre existing models. So even the taqdeer or the designing of the artist is not, and does not compare, of course, to the divine creation or divine creativity, uh, because uh, divine requires no um, uh, prior template, whereas the human artist requires that. The ijad of the artist is from something to something. So the artist uses existing things to form other existing things. Whereas a divine reality creates from nothing. And divine reality existentiates and brings things into existence. Whereas the artist does not bring things into existence. He just transforms existing things into other things. Where the artist most resembles the divine in, in, in creativity is in giving forms to things. That's weird. Giving forms to things. Again, one can make a whole uh, detailed exposition on these distinctions um, because the whole uh, theory of creativity, especially when you link it to the previous section on images and imagination, the whole theory of creativity can, can be articulated in Ibn Arabi here. Suffice it to say that in the hierarchy of creators, there is a divine creator who sits atop the hierarchy. The second degree of creativity for Ibn Arabi belongs to the prophets, the saints, and the mystics. Not that the saints and the mystics are at the same level of the prophets. Come on. But what I mean by here is that uh, one could actually put God, prophets, then saints and mystics below that. But the idea here is that uh, that uh, when when uh, the uh, saints and mystics, for example, engage in the form of uh, uh, of, of, of an inner mirage, or when the saints and mystics engage in a form of, let's say, um, uh, receiving an image in their ru'ya, or in their in their imagination, in their spiritual khayal, an image from above. Uh, for Sheikh Muhyiddin, this is a supreme form of creativity. Um, and it is a form of creativity, ultimately. Um, today, unfortunately, we also associate the term creativity with what artists do. But in fact, creativity is an intrinsic human property that is most manifest in the human being during the ibadat. Uh, and this is quite interesting because we often associate um, creativity with uh, doing art, but this is a, a false um, uh, perception and understanding because it, it is only in recent European understandings of aesthetics and art, which has reduced creativity to the purely realm, pure realm of art only, it is actually impoverished the notion of ibda' and halk, or ibda' um, as understood traditionally by uh, many in the Islamic tradition. The saints and mystics are the most creative insofar as in their ability to open up the eye of the heart and perceive things or give form to things that are formless in the alam al-khayyad. This is the supreme form of creativity. Uh, below that, at the level of the physical 
and psychological, there is the realm of the artist. The realm of the artist that we often associate. So um, artists then are, insofar as they practice art only, uh, embody the lowest type of creativity that human beings are capable of. Um, the artist, insofar as the artist is a muta'abbid who worships Allah, can elevate the creativity, uh, the, the degree of creativity above that uh, level of the regular artist. But only insofar as they embody a modality of ibadah, worship. Okay, so um, Ibn Arabi has a lot to say on the nature of creativity and the artist. Um, and this is a wonderful quote from the Futuhat where he says, there is joy in the very act of creating something that no one has imagined before or thought of. A joy that is analogous, though not similar to the divine joy in creating the world. So here you see he establishes an analogy between the divine creating and the human creating. The sole concern of one who invents is to take separate things, existing things, and configures them, the in his mind in a new and novel way previously unknown to him. The true innovator, al mubdih is he who does not look at anyone except what unfolds within him if he wishes to find joy and pleasure in the joy of creating something new. The most creative or inventive knowers for Ibn Arabi are the eloquent poets, al bulagha and then the geometers, al muhandisun and from among the craftsmen, Ashab al-Sana'a, or Sana'a, they are the carpenters and the builders. In fact, there are several sections in the Qutahat where he discusses carpenters and builders and architects, etc. Again, moving on, uh, I think final point I want to make in regards to Ibn Arabi's creativity is he has this wonderful uh, understanding of the capacity of the artist to breathe life into works of art. And um, in the making of images of plants, for example, the artist does not merely mimic the image of a real plant, but rather engenders another plant. This is a theory of the proliferation of vegetative life, not its imitation. There's a section in the Futahat where Ibn Arabi describes this capacity of the artist to transform stone, which is a lower level of reality, ennobling stone in the form of vegetal motifs, actually for Ibn Arabi breathes a quality of life into the stone, thereby making it closer to vegetal life than to stone itself. This is a very interesting um, theory worth looking into in Arabic. So when you look at this, this is a stone grill that is carved. But to our perceptual senses, it has more of the quality of a living plant than it has of inert sandstone. And so here, Ibn Arabi uh, talks about the capacity of the artist to raise the inert material uh, uh, above its level of existence to a higher level of existence, and that is plant life. Because, of course, in traditional Islamic cosmology, minerals exist at a lower level. Above them, there's vegetal life, and then there's animal life. So the artist has the capacity to elevate mineral life into the level of vegetal life in the artwork. Okay, all right. Um, I'm running out of time here, but very quickly, I wanted to touch on um, also the nature of geometry in Ibn Arabi, he, he has in various, his various writings, he has um, detailed geometric descriptions. And in his understanding of geometry, Ibn Arabi really produces a profound understanding of what geometry actually is. It's a geometry is an intermediary. When you look at a geometric sketch or pattern, it's an intermediary between the sensible world and the spiritual world. So while you look at a physical pattern of a geometric pattern on the wall, its physicality is in its material it is made of, but the pattern itself or for him does not exist at the level of its pure physicality. The pattern actually exists in the realm above the pure physicality of the uh, geometric pattern itself uh, because it acts as an intermediary between the geometric idea and the geometric sketching in the physical world. Um, perhaps during q and I can, I can further allude to what he means by this, um, but a lot of his writings are, uh, have these kind of uh, geometric diagrams everywhere. And he says, he says that these geometric diagrams are drawn so, that, so as to mediate the, the, info, the, sorry, the formless idea into, a, into, a, uh, into a understanding. Sometimes we're unable to understand things uh, at an abstract level or a formless level, and so the geometric sketch is actually uh, uh, a halfway between 
the physical world and the spiritual world because it is uh, a a form, but it's a form that exists within the intermediate world of the imagination. And so this is where he locates these geometric patterns and forms. Okay, I, I mentioned there are various figures. One can do the same uh, with all these other figures and explore what they have to say. Very quickly, in the last minute, I want to show uh, that uh, earlier I said that there are three approaches to the sources. One could look at uh, a school of thought. We looked at uh, falsafa, kalam, and tasawwuf, and ask what do these particular schools of thought have to say about aesthetics and beauty and perception and harmony, etc. Or we could look at the writing to a particular individual and explore what that individual has to say about all these things. Or we could choose a thematic approach. And the thematic approach is basically um, one could make the argument that in the Islamic tradition, uh, the beauty of God, for example, is a theme that pops up in various schools of thought and various authors. And so one chooses a theme and investigates what various traditions and various figures and various schools of thought have to say about this particular theme. There's also one can make the argument that light and color appear quite prominently as themes within uh, the Islamic tradition. So one would then explore what various schools of thought and what various figures and what traditions have to say about light and color. Likewise, one can make the argument for uh, proportion and harmony uh, as being a theme. Uh, psychology of beauty is something that pops up again and again in various Islamic traditions. Creativity, um, again, one can make the argument, and I have made this in an article before, well-being, health, and beauty. There's a relationship that pops up again and again in various Islamic writings on the relationship between our inner and outer well-being and uh, our engagement with beauty. Also, the vision. Uh, um, uh, vision, uh, basar, basira, nazar, um, and the gaze, and the ethical implications of the gaze in the Islamic tradition, which is something I've discussed in a previous article. Uh, published on Kala Research and Media uh, Journal. Uh, there are other themes, of course. I could have touched on many other themes, like the beauty of the human form. It had received a very special attention in the writing of Ibn Arabi and many other figures. Um, another one would be, why did Islam ban the image, for example? Uh, and uh, that's also something that can be explored as a theme. And there are many, many other numerous themes and topics that could be explored in great detail in order to uh, reveal or uncover what the classical Islamic tradition um, had to say about these questions, or to reveal the various the classical Islamic aesthetic sensibilities, if you want to use that term, inshallah. Okay, I'm going to stop there and maybe take a few uh, questions. Um, and then um, uh, perhaps at a later time, a later date, inshallah, we could um, get into ver these various topics in great detail. There's actually one topic that I've uh, uh, that is dear to my heart, and that is the relationship between uh, salat and many of the themes that I've been discussing here today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair. Um, very enriching and informative lecture, um, Dr. Samir. Um, so we're going to open the floor for question and answer now. So um, if you have a question, please post it in the chat area, and then we can show it to Dr. Samir. Uh, before we do that, I'll um, try and mention a couple of my, my own questions here. Um, well, there's, there's many. Uh, that I, I would really like to ask. Um, perhaps I could start with um, uh, a problem that seems to be prevalent in the academy these days, which is this claim of ocular centricism. That mm. uh, we, uh, what do we do of those who have no vision, of those who, um, uh, are say born blind or encounter uh, blindness later in life that there seems to be something at least in, in that literature that critiques European conceptions of prioritize, prioritizing the eye over other say senses of the body um, mm -hmm. how might um, that criticism be levied on 
um, Ibn Arabi's aesthetics and how might the response be given? Very, very important question. I think I, don't, I haven't done the Arabi justice in this presentation by any stretch of the imagination because one could have, um, I focused on certain aspects and themes. Ibn Arabi had detailed discussions on the role of each one of the senses. I may have focused here more on the uh, visual one. But uh, we know from the Islamic understanding of perception of the invisible realities that they they use the term dhok. dhok. So if we were to look at the various way, the ways in which the senses perceive things, the eye perhaps sees things, um, if you look at spectrum of um, the senses, five senses, the eye sees things from a great distance. And so the eye creates a sense of uh, an illusion of a distinction between subject and object. On the exact opposite side of the spectrum, spectrum of the eye is tasting, where perception is an act, act of complete union with the perceived. And so there's no coincidence that then the, the, the ulama uh, use quite rightly the term dhok uh, to refer to the ultimate perception of in, invisible realities. And one could speak at length to this um, the Islamic tradition, often people will say that um, uh, while in the visual arts, you know, the term visual dominates, we focus on the eyes. Actually, uh, Islamic tradition uh, gives equal um, uh, equal value to the ear, hearing. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the, the the art of the Quran is a, a art of uh, hearing the divine words spoken and articulated. And with that comes a whole different kind of aesthetic understanding um, of the world and creation, and one that is focused exclusively on, on seeing. And in regards to what you said about earlier, about um, people who don't see, um, European tradition is largely oculocentric, that is correct, and it does perceive truth as somehow a correspondence between uh, things that are perceived, um, and that is, uh, it's not exaggerated, in fact it is the case. Um, um, and it doesn't necessarily apply to uh, the Islamic tradition. So in fact, one of the interesting things about uh, uh, one of the last quotes I had here in the slides was by a, a German art historian called Hans Belting in his famous book Florence and Baghdad, where he tries to explore the different uh, aesthetic sensibilities of Islam and the West by showing how they are quite radically different. And he says, in the Islamic world, geometry became a symbolic form by being a subject of representation, as opposed to a tool for representation, as in the West. So in Western art, you find that geometry becomes a tool for representing the world with an oculocentric focus, as opposed to geometry being the symbolic form um, being represented. Um, and that reveals a very different aesthetic systems and aesthetic sensibilities uh, between them. And a lot more work, of course, has to be needs to be done on that. There's also a lot of work done uh, on, and I think many of the ulama talk about this, uh, even the blind can have visions. So. Um, while certain types of imagining requires perhaps eyes because it derives the images or the data of, of, of the images from the physical world, certain types of images that come from above do not necessarily always presuppose um, the capacity to see. In fact, the blind have actually had many visions um, and there's a lot of studies today actually on the blind actually dreaming and having dreams and having images and visions. So what that suggests, if anything, uh, and that moves us in a very different direction, but that suggests also that um, rather, than, rather than the mind being a tabula rasa, as 17th, 18th, 19th century um, suggested, actually we're born with pre-existing um, wealth of uh, knowledge, an archetypal endowment, if you will, uh, a fitraic endowment of images and knowledge um, that exists within us to a certain extent, and along which uh, uh, our developmental trajectories move. Um, and so the, the blind seeing suggests that, in fact, the images are coming from somewhere inside, and they may be, uh, and there's a lot, there's a lot to, be, to be said to that, to, to that, inshallah. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um... Okay, so there's a question here that I think overlaps with another question of mine, so let's show it here. It's from um, Sidi Abdul Sulaiman. Is there beauty found in all of Allah's creation, even that which seems devoid of any beauty? And I, I'm just going to tag onto that. Um, how is it that Ibn Arabi, Ibn Arabi may have understood um, uh, 
given the the nafas al rahman um the grotesque the putrid the evil or the perhaps not the evil but the ugly in in, in terms of the aesthetic form if all things have intrinsic beauty so uh, that's interesting i mean it's 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 related to in the similar idea that often found in ibn arabi as to whether evil actually exists or not um yes um as far as I understand it, and I mean, uh, any, I hope I'm representing Sheikh al but here quite um, accurately, but for Ibn Arabi, um, a lot of the standards by which we consider things to be beautiful and ugly, uh, human standards. And so not everything that we necessarily consider ugly is in, actually intrinsically ugly. It could be conventionally ugly. Um, he's quite adamant that everything is intrinsically beautiful. Um, and uh, there is no such thing as intrinsic ugliness, ugliness, and uh, and oh, that the evil, as it were, is narcus and it is uh, illusory in the sense that it is contingent upon uh, a certain way of seeing the world or certain uh, conditions of the world. But it's not intrinsic to the very nature of reality itself. Um, Allah al husna as we say, the most beautiful names of God, which manifest existence and which constitute that level of beauty that I was talking about. Uh, from there come different types of more relative beauty and more relative forms of majesty. Um, um, and so Ibn Arabi would say, you need to train yourself, uh, you need to rise, as a per, as it were, up the levels of the Aqwal and Maqamat uh, to a point where one is able to perceive with a different eye and see that the uh, relative, uh, you know, the uh, beyond the relative and muqayyad to the absolute and mutlaq. And that's where one is able to perceive the intrinsic beauty of things, which is not that different from seeing the intrinsic hikmah of all things also. Um, Very good. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, it, it just you know, kind of gets me thinking of um, how different this would be, say, from a say, an Aristotelian conception of beauty, which is always um, outward. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an intrinsic sense of beauty with Aristotle. I mean, maybe, but in, in the Nicomachean, there will always be references that uh, if someone is uh, not beautiful, it's an indication of the interior being um, uh, off to some sense. Uh, and, and likewise, if there's beauty outwardly, there's beauty inwardly. So he begins with the outward and then moves inward, uh, which it seems, I mean, be maintaining the inward intrinsically regardless of the outward case. Um, and the outward just has to find its way, uh, it seems to, that, that realization, that, that third eye, as we might say. Is that accurate, you would think? I mean... Uh... In in regards to, I mean, in regards to human beings, I think the situation is a bit different. I mean, in, in all things that have an intrinsic uh, fixed ontological reality, um, there is, it is intrinsically beautiful um, um, and almost extrinsically beautiful also. Um, in the realm of the human, we have a remarkable capacity for creating ugliness. Um, um, ugliness uh, overlays the intrinsic beauty. So, but it's us who creates uh, it. That's, it's us who creates it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And wh now, while while some people may be considered to be more beautiful in form than others, that only pertains to the contingent relative beauty. The intrinsic beauty of the human form is beyond uh, any questioning or any doubt. Um, it is the human beings um, whose whose inward ugliness may amplify an outward contingent ugliness. And uh, you see uh, ugliness upon ugliness, as it were. But mm -hmm. intrinsically, the human form, and by form is not just outward form, but also inward form, is intrinsically beautiful. It is we who are capable of corrupting it and rendering it um, uh, ugly. Um, and uh, it's the awliya or those who are able to have perceptual, uh, spiritual perception who can see beyond the outwardly contingent ugliness um, to see the inner beauty shining forth through it. So again, if we're caught in the snare of the outward only, we are only uh, caught in the realm of the contingent and the mukayyad, the relative. No. Um, 
Um, and we, we, many of us have had examples of people who, who may have a very average beauty, but their inner beauty shines forth so brightly that it, it gives them a certain luminosity and a beauty. And you, you might find people who are outwardly very beautiful, but have a very sinister, you know, diabolical soul, as it were. And, and, and despite the beauty, there is a profound ugliness, ugliness there. Yeah. Um, Okay, we have several questions here, so um, let's do this. Ahmed Zuhairi, is geometry also an attempt to visualize the manifestation of being? Yes, absolutely. Um, a dear friend of mine and brilliant scholar, Saman Akash, wrote a book on uh, architecture and cosmology in Ibn Arabi, in pre-modern Islam, where he uh, discusses many of the diagrams Ibn Arabi draws and what we call the geometry of being, the unfolding levels of being that which are visualized in Ibn Arabi in various geometric forms. So geometry is the formal aspect of the unfolding of, of being um, or the output movement of that manifestation of Nafas al-Rahman. Uh, uh, harmonious sound being its equivalent in the realm of sound and tone. Um, in the realm of visual, it being geometry. Etc. Yeah, so geometry. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, and this one, I have a whole, I developed a whole presentation just on geometry at some point. Uh, and geometry, I mean, when you look at the world around you, you don't see geometry, you see things. Geometry is an attempt to bring forth into visual form the underlying archetypal patterns upon which things are brought into existence. So when you draw geometry on a wall, the geometric pattern itself is khayali, it's imaginal. Uh, the materiality of it, the lines, may exist on a, on, uh, I don't know, clay or, or in concrete, sorry, in, in stone or in wood, materiality of it. But the pattern itself is a soul form, as it were. And it, its form, it exists, and it's perceived within the soul. And so its ontological level of reality is not the physical, it is actually the imaginal. Uh, in geometry, always acts as an intermediary. Um, same thing, same thing with mathematics. So there's a very interesting understanding that when you look at geometry, what's happening within your perceptual capacities and your soul is very different than when if you're looking at a painting that looks realistic. What's happening within the viewer gazing upon geometry is radically different from what's happening within the viewer looking at a painting by Michelangelo. And, and that's very interesting to observe and study further because uh, because of the implications uh, it has for a unique understanding of Islamic art. Uh, and we don't have space to get into it here, but uh, yes, is geometry an attempt to visualize the manifestation of being? The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your answer there is, su is suggestive of a more perhaps ph phenomenological approach to art and, uh, and what art does to the the viewer of it, um, in, in a sense, geometric forms seem to do something um, or bring us closer to um, a sense of fitra, a sense of beauty than uh, images as representations or tools of something. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Bulent Kos, uh, generally we are discouraged to think of Allah in terms of an image or a uh, imagery perception. In light of that, is there a contradiction to this when Ibn Arabi converts his thought into geometric shapes? Um, no, because Ibn Arabi is not visualizing God. He's visualizing um, the unfolding of creation. Um, Ibn Arabi doesn't visualize uh, Allah in that sense. Having said that, though, having said that, uh, Ibn Arabi does have something really interesting to say about uh, the nature of Islam. Uh, the Muhammadan mandate uh, and its relationship to imagination and images. So for Ibn Arabi, he has this interesting uh, understanding where he says that if you look at Christianity uh, or if you look at other, other religious traditions, they have, they, they have various forms, um, sacred forms in their art, um, and they tend to visualize God in a certain way. Now, while he severely criticizes that, he understands that, at least in the instance of Christianity, uh, there's a relative uh, element of truth, but a very profound theological error at the same time, in the sense that 
human beings always have a tendency to attempt to visualize that which they don't they can't see um the error of, of christianity i suppose or the error uh, would be that um uh, is to uh, concretize god in any particular image another way of saying that is given that islam is a universal manifestation of rahmah to all humanity uh, islam captures the fullness of the human capacity to relate to God with its insistence on the balance between tanzih and tashbih. So no sooner do you imagine or think of or understand something about a divine name or divine reality, tashbih, then tanzih automatically er erases that and uh, um, effaces it. And Ibn Arabi says something really interesting. He says, you can only do this constant uh, erection of an image and its erasure, or its imagining of an image and its complete dissolution, only in hayal, imagination. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, if you've ever read the book, uh, Lord of the Rings, for example, uh, at various points in your life, you read the book, you read the characters, you imagine the landscape of Middle Earth, you imagine Gandalf the Grey and Gandalf the White in various ways. Depending on your understanding, depending on your state of knowledge, depending on your imagination, depending on your mood, depending on your hal, it constantly changes. Why? Because no sooner do you concretize a particular image than it dissipates and, and, and changes. So imagination has this capacity to imagine and dissolve, imagine and dissolve. If you watch the movie and then read the book, you can never get the image of, Gan uh, of Ian McKellen out of your head. You can never get the image of New Zealand as Middle Earth out of your head. Right. And so what happens here is a very danger. When you concretize an image in the sensible world, you ensnare the imagination and you imprison it. That's the more the less, yeah. To yeah. al khayal. Yeah. And the problem here is, and for all educators out there, where our kids who are exposed to TV all the time, an overexposure to uh, in, uh, images uh, uh, impoverishes the imagination. But the Arabi says, if Islam is the religion universally sent to all humanity, within which all the jaliyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are perceivable through the intricate balance of this constant interplay between tashbih and tanzir, or the two eyes of our inner perception, then we can only possibly imagine the God in our khayyad. Now, what he means by that is, no sooner do you conjure up an image than it dissolves. And so the imagination khayyad, which is the, the eye of the heart, and by, by khayyad here I mean the spiritual imagination, not the lower imagination, as I talked about earlier. The spiritual imagination has the capacity to uh, uh, imagine and dissolve, imagine and dissolve. And so it has the capacity to constantly fluctuate with the constant fluctuations of divine tajallis. And this is unique to Islam, by the way, the Arabi says. He only associates it with Islam, not with any other religious traditions. So um, in this sense, then, uh, Islam urges us to use the imagination because the imagination is the only faculty of perception or the eye within us that is capable of moving with the perpetual khalq jadid or perpetual manifestations of Allah in creation. Um, but no sooner is an image imagined than it is dissolved. Imagine and dissolve, imagine and dissolve. Uh, the error is when this image becomes concretized in physical form, that's deeply problematic. And that's the real reason why Ibn Arabi says in Islam, you cannot give image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in concrete form, nor of any living thing, uh, especially the prophets and the, uh, uh, that's, the, that's the reason why. Because what you do is, while you may think it supports your capacity to better understand God by giving it a concrete form, you're closing off all other possible ways of understanding and perceiving Allah, thereby impoverishing your spiritual perception. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I mean, especially in the, you think, because this is quite reminiscent of Plato and the Republic when he speaks of geometric forms as being the intermediary between the world mm. of sensation and the, the highest good. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yet, in Greek uh, culture, the, the human body is um, uh, lauded to such an extent that it it is a... Uh, an appropriation of the divine of some kind um, mm. In, mm. in the world, which is very although, different. Although many, yeah. yeah, very different. Yeah, although the, many of the Greek philosophers were critical of what the artists were doing. Sure, sure, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that never caught was, on. Is is what I mean. They never caught on. No, they yeah. never caught on. No, never caught on. No, there was yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we'll take one more. Um, let's see here, Hamza Qadri. Uh, how do you understand or explain the experience of synesthesia, synesthesia within the categorization mm -hmm. you provided, i.e., the phenomenon of visual ex experience associated with sonic experiences? I mean. Synesthesia is when when the the senses overlap and the ability to perceive. Um, uh, yeah, I mean these are these are not. I mean the term actual term isn't used, but uh, uh, the um, the scholars, especially Ibn Arabi, talks about um, the capacity of. Well, so when he talks about the senses, for example, he has this amazing thing. He says, for example, some orafa, some scholars are specialists in the ability to unveil reality visually. Some scholars. Uh, uh, develop the the gift from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to unveil reality through the ear, right? Uh, so through hearing the word, some have the capacity to do it through smell, uh, and and here Abu Hanifa links it to the Hadith of Prophet Sallam about uh, the beautiful perfume and and uh, etc. and the and Nafis al Rahman in in Ajidu Nafis al Rahman Kabal Yaman, you know. And, and many. So each one of the senses has the capacity to unveil reality. Uh, but then he goes on to say that some orafa master all the senses and some orafa able to perceive, this is the interesting thing, able to perceive and unfold reality through one of the senses. So they're, they're able to unfold all aspects of reality or all the senses through one sense. Right? So Being they're able one? to, any one of them. Uh, any one of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, so one is able to perceive, uh, you know, some of the, the, the awliya are able to perceive, let's say, through nafas, the nafas, yeah. to okay. smell, the capacity to smell and perceive that. They're able to unveil that which is seen by other awliya through the eye and the ear. So yeah. at the lower level, we call this synesthesia, at the level of uh, everyday experiences when they overlap. But at the higher levels, there is a remarkable convergence of yeah. the various senses because Often we tend we tend to think the senses are that um, uh, that through which we uh, uh, the tools through which we perceive a certain aspect of reality, but in actual fact it's not the senses that are that are perceiving the senses are it's actually the soul that perceives through the senses and insofar as the, the soul is heightened in its capacity its perceptual capacity it's actually able to perceive various type of sensory data through various types of senses sense perceptions. Um, I haven't done enough work on that, but uh, on that particular reference in Ibn Arabi as to where, when he describes this particular thing, uh, because it just blew my mind. Um, and it has to do with, of course, Awal al maqamat that, of course, I've, I've, uh, I've probably never, will never achieve in this lifetime. But um, uh, th there are very, mashallah, uh, detailed expositions on the senses. Um, and of course, the senses here are not just the physical senses, because the physical senses are nothing but manifestations of the higher senses. Uh, we often have this relationship inverted where we tend to think that we use analogously uh, uh, our senses to understand higher realities, when in actual fact, our senses are projections of higher modalities of perception, which will go, go all the way back to some of the divine names, you know, Sami al Basir, etc. I don't think anyone addresses that to a certain extent. Uh, a lot, a lot can be said. I have to really point out that I haven't done justice to Sheikh Al Akbar here. There's so much that can be done, um, so much more. That each one of those slides can be an entire presentation. Right. No, Marshall, you've done uh, what you could <laughs> in the time you were given. So. Mm -hmm. um, there is a request here for books. You did mention some. Maybe you could re repeat uh, some of those books. Yeah, there, there is, uh, I mean, Hans Belting's Florence and Baghdad. That is uh, a recent book called um, What is Islamic Art by, um, what's her name? Sorry. Let me just, uh, that is um, by an, an uh, author whose name just eludes me right now. Um, Anne something, Anna something, I think. There's uh, a book by, Valerie Gonzalez called Beauty and, and Islam. Um, those are quite good books on Islamic aesthetics. Um, there's a book called Islamic Aesthetics and Introduction by, by Oliver Lehman, the well-known scholar uh, who works on um, 
Islamic philosophy. If you want, I can send a, a list of recommended books and then you, perhaps you can share it with the, with the audience. Off the top of my head, I can't really think of too many right now. Uh, you mentioned an emerging theology. Oh, yes. Samar Akash, um, uh, Ibn Arabi, Cosmology and Architecture in Premodern Islam. It's a book on Ibn Arabi's aesthetics and cosmology in relationship to space and architecture. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. I think specifically given um, this talk and its focus on Ibn Arabi, that might be most pertinent uh, to, the, to the question. The book was recently published on on the the fact that reality and existence consist of letters and words and it's based on Ibn Arabi's work it's by an author um, whose name eludes me right now but if you google um, Ibn Arabi the world as a word or something like that the book title might come up I completely forgot the title of the book it came out recently I haven't read it yet but uh, it does cover an aspect of Ibn Arabi and there's also several uh, books, um, several th the PhD theses who cover that cover the topic of aesthetics in Arabic. Um, so yeah, yeah inshallah. Tamam, Allah <clears> uh, for really a uh, a riveting um, presentation, and um, we'll have to watch it. I think more than once to grasp um, many of the ramifications of this um, so from from all of us at Dawah Qasim we thank you for joining and we thank Dr. Samir Mahmoud for his talk today on Ibn Arabi's aesthetics it seems it was more than merely a few introductory remarks mashallah and, uh, yes, it was much more than that Jazakallah. the beneficial inshallah barakallah thank you very much and uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum